Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. So we got met, did our consultation. Um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us. Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us.
Hi, good evening, and we're really thrilled to have you. My name is Elaine Sulkin, and I am the publisher and CEO of ParentMap. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Screen Time, Screen Time Reset, Expert Guidance for a Healthier Media Diet with Dr. Dimitri Christakis of Seattle Children's Hospital. For those of you not familiar with ParentMap, just like our parenting media partners tonight who have joined us from across the country, it's our business to build inclusive communities that inform, engage, and inspire parents like you and your family, hopefully while having plenty of fun. We're all extremely focused on how to better serve families and being the parents and publishers who we are, we never settle for the status quo. And it means that our deep community connections, family advocacy and unique partnerships allow us to build a better village for our families. So today, before we start, we have a couple of housekeeping items. A couple of people have already asked. The webinar is being recorded. It will be republished for educational and promos promotional usage. And we will email it to everyone who registered uh, for the event tonight. Also, we have already received many, many dozens of questions. But during the course of, of Dr. Christakis's talk, please use your Q&A. And we will get as many questions in as we possibly can. Again, I want to thank our media partners, Chicago Parent, Metro Parent in Detroit, Baton Rouge Parents, New York Family, and NOLA Family in New Orleans. And we could not do this without our event sponsors, Seattle Children's Hospital, Seattle Nanny Network, Wayne County Community College District, the Community of Mindful Parenting, KNKX, Pacific Medical Centers, Washington College Savings Plan, and World Schools. Dr. Dimitri Christakis is the Director of Seattle Children's Research Institute Center for Child Health, Behavior, and Development. He's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine and a pediat pediatrician at Seattle Children's Hospital. He is a leading expert on how media affects child health and development and has published dozens of studies and co-authored the groundbreaking book, The Elephant in the Living Room, Make Television Work for Your Kids. Dr. Krasakis is also editor-in-chief of the journal JAMA Pediatrics, and we are really thrilled to have Dr. Krasakis back with us. So welcome. Join me in welcoming him. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And I, I can't hear your applause. So I don't even know if my audio is working. But um, it's, it's an honor to be with you to talk about this important topic. And thank you for taking some time if you're joining me live out of what is um, a, a very important family time uh, in the, in the uh, early evening. So there's so much ground to cover when we're talking about children and media. And I saw some of the questions that were submitted. I wanna say at the outset, I'm not gonna be able to answer all of your questions, not because I don't have an answer, but we're not gonna have enough time. But we will provide a link um, to a series of webinars that have been put on by Children and Screens, which is a not-for-profit institute developed um, to help children lead a healthy life in a digital world. And um, I'm on the board of advisors of that, and I'm in some of the webinars, but uh, they're, I think about 20 or 30 of them that will cover every topic you want with international experts. So those will all be available to you. And if your question is not answered by any of those, then you can always follow up with me through a um, private email. Today, I'm actually going to talk, I'm going to devote the bulk of my talk to a single topic that um, I actually was um, interested in um, even before the pandemic started. And um, so the talk today is going to be about digital addiction. And I want to make sure, first of all, does that, does that working? Is that the appropriate view? I'm guessing yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about digital addiction. Yes. And, you know, this is a topic I was in, interested in. Um, well, for many years, but uh, I put I started talking about it about three years ago, and this was the title of that talk: "Digital Addiction: A 21st Century Public Health Crisis." Obviously, um, this public health crisis has been overshadowed by another one, but that other one that we're hopefully in the tail end of um, hasn't made this one go away. In fact, it's probably made it more significant, and we'll see the effects of it even after COVID 
um, becomes a distant memory. So to set the stage for this, I want to kind of give you a real whirlwind quick tour of the history of screens. So here's a timeline. The, the very first television was developed in 1927. This is actually a picture of it. Um, it's remarkably similar to the TV I watched as a kid, but I, I'm, I'm dating myself by saying that. The first color television was invented in 1943. Um, you can see this is an actual picture of it. The first liquid crystal display, the sort of thin screen most of us are familiar with, it was actually invented in 1964. This is not a picture of that. I couldn't find an original picture of it. Um, and so you can see uh, really from the beginning of television up until very, very recently, screens got, um, uh, color was added, they became a little thinner, but the general experience of watching television or watching a screen was largely unchanged. It was a passive experience until 2009. So for almost a hundred years, most of us were watching television or watching screens in much the same way we always had. And April uh, 3rd, actually 12 years ago, was when, when this device that we all are so familiar with made its debut. What that means essentially is that children that are about 12 years old today, or, or um, older or younger rather, um, I've never lived in a world without touch screens, um, but they're all still very, very young in terms of what this is gonna mean for them over their course of their entire lives. Now, this is a quote from Nick uh, Bilton um, in the New York Times uh, when he was interviewing Steve Jobs. And you may be familiar with this. Steve Jobs was asked about his own children's use of tablets or iPads, and he says they really haven't used it at all. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. So Steve Jobs, who was obviously one of the innovators of this revolution, um, limited his own kids' use. And when I saw that, um, I also saw this shortly thereafter, the Tony Fidel, who was one of the fathers of the iPad, one of the early inventors said, I wake up in cold sweats every so often thinking, what did we bring to the world? When I heard that quote, um, I was reminded of this quote that, many of you may be familiar with by Oppenheimer, who was one of the um, inventors of the atomic bomb. And I bring up Oppenheimer's quote, not to be alarmist, although one might say that anytime you invoke kind of nuclear war, you are being alarmist. I bring it up because the common thread here is that it's not infrequent or not uncommon, I should say, for inventors of one technology that have a specific purpose in mind to regret unforeseen consequences of that technology after it's been rolled out. And Oppenheimer did that with nuclear energy. And it looks like the inventors of the iPad had second thoughts about what they had actually brought about. Now, when we talk about digital addiction, really the, the poster child, if you will, was a boilermaker, and I, I can't pronounce his name correctly. He was 28 years old. He left work on a Friday afternoon in South Korea, um, went to an internet cafe and dropped dead uh, 70 hours later playing StarCraft, essentially nonstop without eating or drinking. His death um, got South Korea interested in the problem of digital addiction long before we were. And in fact, the problem of digital addiction, and I might add the prevention and treatment of it is much further along in Asian countries than it is in the United States. Most of us, of course, are familiar with addictions and we are very familiar with certain types. We know about pharmacologic addictions, whether it's opioids or alcohol or nicotine. And we know of a behavioral addiction that the only officially recognized behavioral addiction is gambling addiction. And that itself was quite an undertaking to get it recognized officially as an addiction. But whatever kind of addiction we're talking about, they all have a common pathway in the brain. And that pathway is what's called the dopamine reward pathway. The dopamine reward pathway begins with the signal 
deep in the brain in an area called the ventral tegmental area. And that area sends a signal to the nucleus accumbens, which is kind of the pleasure center of the brain. And the brain experiences that um, as reward. And then it sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of the, the nerve center, the, the executive center of our brains and says to that part of the brain, I like that, um, do that again, or get more of that. This is a generic pathway. It can be activated by behaviors or by things that we ingest. It's actually activated when you praise your child for something they do. They experience that as a reward. They send the signal to the prefrontal cortex and you make it more likely that they'll do it again in search of praise. So a bit about how habits form. So um, obviously addictions are part of a habit or I guess an extreme habit, if you will. But the way habits form is actually interesting and I think illustrative of how, how addiction actually can happen. So a lot of what we know about habit formation comes from a Macaw monkey named Julio and a German neuroscientist named Wolfram. And together they did a series of experiments. And basically uh, Wolfram put Julio into a box, into a chamber here. And you can see that there was an electrode that was monitoring uh, the pleasure center of Julio's brain. There was a device here that would dispense blackberry juice, um, which is uh, Julio's favorite treat. There's a response bar for him to push, and there's a stimulus screen that he looks at. And at some point, an, uh, a stimulus appears on the stimulus screen. Julio pushes the response bar when he sees it, and he's given some juice as a result of that. And all the while, there's a recording happening in the pleasure center of his brain. And what's really interesting is if you look on the next slide, this is the um, activation in Julio's brain in, in the pleasure center while he's being trained, while he's learning um, how to work this game, if you will. So you can see here that the shape appears on the screen. Julio pushes the lever, he gets some juice, and then you see this big surge here in uh, activation in the pleasure center of his brain when he gets the blackberry juice. But shortly after getting trained, um, what we see is something very, very different. Once Julio actually learns how this game works, what we see is that the moment the shape appears on the screen, he gets a huge activation in his pleasure center. Then he pushes the lever and then he gets the juice. So this reversal is a, is a sign that he's actually become, learned to equate seeing that image on the screen with pleasure itself, regardless of whether or not he's getting the blackberry juice, he gets the blackberry juice after he actually experienced the reward. And to give you an example of this from children, um, this is a summary, it's called a meta-analysis. It's a summary of lots of different studies that have looked at the presence of a cellular phone in children's bedroom and both bedrooms and the likelihood that they'll have sleep problems, meaning that they can't fall asleep on time. And what you see is the bottom right corner here, as you summarize all of these studies together, is that just having a phone in the bedroom increases the likelihood that children will have sleep problems by 80%. It's not that they're on the phone, necessarily. It's just the phone being there. It's become like Julio when he's trained. It's a distraction. It's activating their brain. They're really wondering what's on it. Have I gotten a like for one of my Instagrams? Have I gotten a response to my last text? Um, is anybody else posting something? It's an incredibly activating experience. Now, I want to couch all of this by leading you to think about uh, media use in general, not as necessarily a bad thing. I don't want you to leave this talk saying, Dr. Krasaka said, um, my child should never use any media. I think in fact, the way to think about this, one way of thinking about it 
is that it can actually be too much uh, of even a good thing. Now, I'm an epidemiologist in addition to being a pediatrician. And epidemiologists like to think in terms of exposures and outcomes. So um, uh, how much of something you do or exposed to and what it does to you. Think about the simplest relationships are what we think of as sort of monotonic linear relationships. The amount of potato chips you eat and your weight. More potato chips, more weight gain, and that goes on kind of forever. The more difficult type of relationships to explore are what we think of as kind of nonlinear relationships. And an example of that is stress. So um, we know that if you are, uh, if you don't have a lot of stress or if you have too much stress, your performance is actually inhibited. So if, you're, if your child or you for that matter is very, very relaxed when you're faced with a challenge, you don't do very well or as well as you could. If you're incredibly stressed, you don't do very well either. There's a sweet spot. There's the right amount of stress that optimizes performance. The classic example of this that took many years to figure out is um, alcohol ingestion and um, health. Now we know that too much alcohol is very unhealthy. People die early as a result of complications from alcohol ingestion. And for many years, people assumed that um, it must be true that any alcohol, that alcohol is a toxin and any alcohol intake is bad. But in fact, what we've learned is again, that there's an inverted, inverted U to alcohol consumption, that mild to moderate drinking, one glass of wine a day, um, one to two glasses of wine a day, it's different for men and women, is actually healthier than not drinking at all. It's only when you get to 17 or 18 drinks a week for women or 21 drinks a week for men that you start to see an actual increase in mortality risk over time. And we see a very similar relationship with screen time and depression risk, that not being on screens at all is about the equivalent to being on screens two hours a day. Being on screens between uh, zero and two hours a day actually is associated with reduced depression. And then you can see as screen time continues to increase, the risk of depression goes up and up and up. Now, one of the challenges for those of us that research children in media is that you might ask either now or later or be asking yourself, well, what does screen time mean? There's all kinds of screen time. My child's been going to school on screens for the last two years. You're absolutely correct. One of the biggest challenges we face as scientists is trying to disaggregate the effects of different types of screen exposure. We know that it matters. We know that what children watch is as important as how much they watch, but most of the data we have um, aren't able to collect, be collected at that level of granularity. Now the DSM-5, which some of you may be familiar with, it's sort of the psychiatric Bible that defines everything that's a disorder. Um, in 2013, so almost 10 years ago, said that internet gaming disorder is in need of further study. I am on the expert panel that is revising the DSM-5, and I expect that internet gaming disorder will be included in the revision as a recognized disorder. The WHO, the World Health Organization, five years later, did uh, classify gaming disorder as a new disorder. But from my perspective, I think calling it or focusing on gaming is way too limited. Um, for one thing, it's a very dated term. Uh, gaming doesn't include apps and social media, which is where most of our children, most of us spend most of our time. It's also somewhat gendered. Because at least historically, uh, boys have preferred games and girls have preferred social media. And so we're doing uh, girls a disservice by not recognizing that problematic social media usage might also be a problem. I prefer digital addiction. That's the title of this talk. That's the work that we're doing at Seattle Children's trying to figure out. This says, if you can read this, somebody stole my iPhone. So. Briefly, digital addiction, you're all familiar with the fear of missing out phenomenon or FOMO. You might be familiar with nomophobia or no mobile phone phobia. Um, ask yourselves, if you find yourself without your phone on you, 
Do you have a moment of panic? Does your blood pressure go up? Does your heart rate pick up? I do. I'm always checking to make sure I have my phone with me. And I live for 40 some years without a phone, a mobile phone. Um, traditionally, digital addiction has been viewed as a problem of adolescents and adults. And at the end of our talk today, or my talk, I will show you how it really starts very, very young. So those of you that have young children also need to be concerned. The epidemiology of gaming disorder, it, it's about five to 12% around the world. As I mentioned earlier, it's more common in Asian countries. It's also more common in children with ADHD, with anxiety and with depression. A lot of what we know about um, addiction uh, comes from work by B.F. Skinner. Some of you may have taken B.F. Skinner in uh, college if you took an introduction to psychology. He did a lot of experiments with uh, rats and actually with birds in what he called a Skinner box. And he would put the rat in this box and there was a response lever very much like, and a food dispenser very much like what, what you saw with Julio and Wolf Rand. There was a loudspeaker and lights and there's an electrified grid. And um, Skinner was trying to see how he could make the rat addicted to the light, to stare at the light uh, incessantly. Um, if he were alive today, this is how he would have conducted his experiments. But Skinner found some very interesting and important things. The first thing he found was that if you reward the behavior, meaning that if the light went on and the rat pushed the lever and it got a pellet, um, you would increase the likelihood that it would stare at the light. And we see lots of examples of this in the games and the social apps uh, uh, that our children play with. Um, getting uh, 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 objects during a game can, can, can reward the behavior. Getting likes on Instagram uh, rewards the behavior. The second thing that Skinner found that was really um, incredibly important, probably his most novel finding, was that if the reward was unpredictable, that if not every time the light went on and the rat pushed the lever, did it get a pellet, it would increase the likelihood that they would be addicted. And in fact, this is the underlying philosophy behind um, uh, the way um, slot machines are organized. That's what makes them very, very addictive. While you're not getting a reward, you hear people around you getting a reward almost invariably, and it makes you much more likely to pull the, um, the lever again. And this happens with our children as well. Valued objects, whether they're in games or in social media sites, appear at random. Imagine, if you will, if Instagram or Facebook or whatever only updated once a day at five o'clock. There would be no reason to pick up your phone uh, to go to that website or that app at any other time. But they don't do that. It's quite deliberate that it's random because they know that that's gonna make it much more likely that you pick up your phone to look. And the final thing that Skinner showed was that if you punish avoidance, if the light went on and the rat failed to push um, the lever and got a, slight, a small shock, it also increased the likelihood that they would uh, fixate on the light. And of course, there are many, many games, many social media platforms where children and adults are penalized for leaving. The other sort of seminal work in this area was done by Vygotsky, who was a kind of the father of, of, of uh, developmental psychology uh, a long time ago in the early part of the 20th century. And he defined what he called the zone of proximal development. Now, to put this in context, there are kind of three zones of activities for children. The first is the zone of activity that your child, whatever age they are, um, although this was for young children, could do things all by themselves. Um, and that builds confidence, it builds self-esteem, it can be gratifying, um, and it can promote independence. And the furthest out zone, if you will, is a zone of activities that are just beyond your child's ability to do under any circumstances. They can't do it at all. Those activities can be frustrating. They can make and, and lead to the opposite. They can lower self-esteem and make children feel inadequate. And in between those two is what he called the zone of proximal development, the series of activities that your child can do with help. He called it scaffolding. And when a parent, when you as a parent help your child do something that they couldn't do before, that's not in that inner zone, you build their confidence. And then over time, of course, that goes into the zone of things that they can do on their own. Now this for children was expanded to kind of a more broad vision of the psychology of optimal experience generally. So if you look here at this graph where skills are 
uh, marked down here and challenges are marked here, things where the skills, where your skills are high and the challenges are low lead to boredom and things where your skills are low and the challenges are high lead to anxiety, right? I, I can't do this, it's very, very stressful. But in this zone here, the so-called flow channel is your zone of proximal development. It's that part that keeps you sufficiently engaged that you like the experience, but not so challenged that you find it anxiety provoking or so easy that you're bored. And games today and apps are designed quite deliberately to keep us, to keep our children in that flow channel. They're very, very easy to play, to start, and they ramp up intelligently. When your child plays Candy Crush, it's different than when any other child plays Candy Crush. That game is becoming optimized to their level of interest, to their skills, to always be just challenging enough um, to keep them engaged. And in fact, our own Microsoft and other uh, game developers actually employ uh, PhD behavioral scientists to try to make games more engaging, to try to make it more difficult for uh, children to turn their games off. Why? Because as you know, games evolved from when I was a kid where you would buy them and own them to where you rented them to now where they're free, but they're monetizing your experience. So Fortnite, you're all familiar with if you have middle school children, this is old data. It had over 200 million users. It's free to play, but they have made billions of dollars by getting children to buy stuff in the app. And they've made untold amounts of money selling children's data. Completely different gaming model from what we grew up with, but totally dependent on getting children to stay on the screen. Snapchat, some of you are familiar with, they were facing um, a lot of competition, trying to be the preferred app for children to communicate. And some behavioral scientists came up with the concept of the Snapchat streak. If you guys aren't familiar with what the Snapchat streak is, it's that if I Snapchat a friend on a given day and they Snapchat me back, that's a Snapchat streak of one. And then the next day, if we do it, it's two. If one of us fails to respond or we in any given day, the streak is broken, okay? This was a way of gamifying friendship. I can assure you that the makers at Snapchat did not do this to try to promote friendships. Um, they did it to try to get children to stay on Snapchat. And it monitors and keeps you up to date with each of your friends and what your Snapchat streak is. I'll show you some quotes here. I won't read them. You can read them yourselves from children about how they view Snapchat streaks, how they've come to view it as a sign of their friendship, um, how important their friends are, what a sad commentary this is brought to us by people that whose only interest was in getting children to spend more time on their platform and less on someone else's. In fact, this is such a problem that there's actually secondary apps now that will keep your Snapchat streak alive for your child without them even having to do it. So imagine that there's actually um, apps that will just Snapchat back and forth so that your child can feel that they have very good friends. This is all because, as I mentioned, we live in this attentional economy. Every button on your screen, on every button on your phone is monetizing the time that you're spending on their um, platform. And what that creates is essentially this, that we're so attuned to our phone that we miss uh, something like this. Many of you may be familiar with this very famous scene from, um, uh, from a museum where children were not looking at the Renaissance, at, at the Rembrandt painting, but were set on their phone. Um, it turns out that this was wrong, that they had been told to look stuff up and that they were actually looking before. But the problem we all know about children being distracted and that for that matter, parents being distracted is a real thing. It's also important to think about addiction like we think about most things today as an interaction between nature and nurture which is to say that um, we're born with a certain genetic predisposition to develop an addiction, whether it's alcohol addiction or gambling addiction, and then we're exposed to the substrate um, enough and we develop that addiction. 
The challenge with digital addiction is that the nurture part of it is everywhere. It's almost as if we lived in a society where we had to drink three or four glasses of wine every day. If we live in that society, everybody that was at risk of developing alcoholism would. And that's pretty much the case for uh, digital addiction. There's so much expected usage of digital media that any child that's at risk for developing it is at high risk. Here's a picture I found on the internet of the Newcastle Airport in 1990s, almost 30 years ago. Um, if we were in person, I would ask you what stands out when you look at this picture. I'm sure you're all saying it out loud to yourselves. And the answer is that no one's on their device. People are quote unquote doing nothing or talking with their neighbor or reading. When I show this to my son, who's now 24 years old and actually works in the tech industry, he said, yeah, dad, but this is what they're all thinking. It's very different, of course, from the way airports are today, where everybody is um, on their device all the time. Um, and for that matter, they're on the device all the time, wherever they are. So first teaching point with respect to that, um, those of you that have children who don't yet have a smartphone, or even if they just got it, um, you're asking yourselves, or you might be asking me, um, when should I get my child a smartphone? And um, the first question I would ask you to ask yourself is why do you want to get your child a smartphone? And I know what you're going to say, because I've heard it in my practice and in my research, because you want to be able to reach your child and you want them to be able to reach you. Um, that's very valid reason. Uh, I didn't even have that when my children were, were younger, and I certainly didn't have it when I was a child. Um, but you don't need a smartphone for that. Dumb phones do it quite well. Um, and I would urge you to start with that. It, your child won't want it, um, per se, because it doesn't let them do what they really want to do on it. It's funny, you know, we call it a phone, but it's the one thing children don't really do is talk on it. Um, now, that said, um, I would suggest that you make it very clear that, the, that having a phone is a privilege and not a right, and that the phone is yours and they can use it. Much like you might think about your car, that it's not their car, it's your car and they can use it. It's not, um, it's not a right of theirs, it's a privilege that you give to them and that, you can and that you can revoke. And I would even go so far as to sign a contract with them before you get them the phone. And if you Google smartphone contract, um, you'll find hundreds of examples on the internet. There are actually some of the children and screens website that I mentioned before. Um, you could either choose one of those or you can cut and paste from them, but they all have essentially the same elements, what the expectations are and what the penalties will be for violating those expectations. I would urge you to print one of these out, to sign it and to have your middle school child sign it as well so that you have that conversation and you have very clear expectations um, and sanctions. Treating digital addictions, there are hundreds of treatment centers in Asia. The first US inpatient center, Restart, is actually on the east side here of, uh, in Redmond. It was founded in 2009. Uh, treatment is usually eight to 12 weeks. Um, there are many additional treatment sites now available. Really the evidence of how effective treatments are is quite limited. Uh, and the long-term data are lacking. So the best thing to do is to avoid having your child develop media addiction, um, especially because the risk of relapse is high, right? Normally when we think of addictions, we think the first, the first premise of recovery is abstinence. Well, it's pretty hard to abstain from any use of digital media and be employed in almost any industry in the United States. It would, it would be kind of like, you know, being an al a recovering alcoholic and the only jobs are as bartenders. There are lots of things now that give you feedback on your screen time, and I would encourage you to use those for yourselves and um, to teach your children to use them. And the, my lab focuses in particular on young children, and much of what I talked about was older children, but I wanna talk about how young children and toddlers might be at the greatest risk of all for developing screen addiction. And there are two reasons for this. Um, the first is that children are born and to try and understand causality. And the second is what's called the violation of expectation paradigm. And let me walk through both of these and then I'll give you some examples. So we're born without knowing 
uh, how the world works. Your baby comes into this world with no understanding of the rules of this universe. And they spend an enormous amount of energy, of cognitive energy, trying to figure out cause and effect. What makes something happen? What are the rules of this world? And um, from that perspective, um, I might ask you, what's the one thing that a child never says or never thinks as they're trying to figure out the world when they're using old media, when they're watching a show on television or on their iPad? The one thing they never think or never say is, I did it. Because in fact, they're not doing anything. As we talked about at the very beginning, it's a totally passive experience. Now, when I show you this child here, this, this five-month-old, what do you think, if we were in an audience, I would ask you out loud, what is this child going to do with the toys that are on their high chair? Uh, any of you who, who are parents or grandparents know that this child will throw these toys or push these toys off their chair. And a first-time parent will dutifully go and pick the toys up and put them back. And the child will delight in this. That's probably what's already happened here. They've made something happen. And they'll throw the toys off again, and the parent will come back with them and the child will even be more happy. They've figured out now that they can make something happen reliably. Pretty soon the parent realizes they're in an infinite loop and they stop bringing the toys back, at which point the toddler often has a meltdown. But the, the, the point here is that this feedback mechanism, this ability of the child to understand causality is intensely gratifying and stopped only because a parent tires. But the iPad doesn't tire. An infant pushing a button and making rel something reliably happen gets that dopamine release, gets that feedback, understands or thinks they understand the way this world works. And the iPad never says, I'm done with you. So that's one part. The other part is the, as I mentioned, the violation of expectation paradigm. So as children are trying to figure out how things work, they build a series of expectations. So for example, if I bring, as we do, bring uh, young children, toddlers into the lab, and we put them in front of a puppet show, uh, a puppet stage like this with two puppets, and we close the curtains, and then we open the curtains, and we're tracking their eyes with sophisticated uh, hardware and software that we have to look, how long are they staring at the puppet theater? And we compare this experience with this one. Which one do you think they look at longer? That's a pregnant pause for effect. It's this one, much longer. We've totally blown their minds. They don't understand how this is possible. And they stare at it very, very intently, trying to figure out um, what happened. Now this violation of expectation paradigm can be built in explicitly into games and apps for children, or even the device itself, right? That infant that I showed you a minute ago, who's just pushing buttons on the iPad, as often as she's making something happen that she's predicting will happen, just by chance, is gonna push something at random and have something unexpected happen. And that's gonna draw her attention in even more. And I wanna show you briefly now how we study this in the lab. We do what's called a response to behavior request. So we bring, this is one of the tests we do, I should say. So we bring, these are young children, 18 to 24 month olds into the lab and we randomize them to play with one of three toys uh, in a random order. So the first is an Elmo's guitar, which is a toy that my kids grew up with. And then there's gonna be an app which simulates the Elmo's guitar. The Elmo's guitar, if you push buttons, it makes music. The Music Sparkles app, if you push buttons, it plays the piano. And then the third thing is this Peg's Parade, which is a kind of a very stimulating game for young children, which does all kinds of predictable and unpredictable things when they push the screen. At a very uh, prescribed time, one of my research assistants is gonna ask the child to return the toy. And we look to see whether they return it or not. And here I'll show you across the three conditions. This is Nora, she's 18 months old. She's here with her mom. And the first is Elmo's guitar. Can you say? Can you say? Give it to me. Okay. Good 
job. Okay, let's clean it up. Okay, and now it's the Music Sparkles app. I don't know if Popo did that one. Popo. Popo played the piano. Want to try the piano? Can I that one? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's right back here. Let's see. Give it to me. Thank you. All done. Good job. Okay, and this last one is what I mentioned. This is Peg's Parade app, and I'll show you briefly what this is like, and you'll see that- it's Choice. Uh, Three, two, one. Look a friend to add them to your band. Add so more friends to your band. They're part of like Sparkle, and things pop up. Sometimes it's things that the child predicted. Sometimes it's different things. All kinds of stuff is going on here, and watch what happens. You see, she pushed something by mistake and she's now she's trying to figure out what happened and she won't return it. And when we compare it across the three conditions, what we see is in fact that these highly engaging, and I use that term in quotes, apps are much less likely to be returned than even electronic toys, never mind kind of more traditional toys. Okay. I've gone through this fairly quickly. I'm going to have some time for questions, but not enough for all of them. I want to end with sort of my top 10 practical tips briefly for um, building healthy media habits. Number 10, start working on your child's media habits early. I just showed you video of how early children already start to develop problematic usage. So don't wait. Think about it um, as early as, your, as, as during their infancy. Number nine. Look for low risk games. I showed you what constitutes high risk games. Um, don't think that, you know, nothing is for free. Be willing to pay for something that has uh, fewer addictive elements in it. Number eight, self-monitoring. Teach your children, especially when they're old enough to have their own phone, to um, use uh, Apple screen time or any other, um, uh, uh, platform or, or software to uh, be aware of how much time they're spending on their screen and thoughtful about it. Number seven, digital curfew. Absolutely no device in the bedroom. We talked about already how that's a problem. And at least one hour before bedtime, the TV, all digital devices off and outside of the bedroom. Number six, smartphone contract. We talked about that really important for the use of a phone in the acquisition of a phone. And if they already have it, um, it's not too late to start to tell them that you're gonna institute a contract now. Number five, daily screen free time. I was one of the authors of the American Academy of Pediatrics. You maybe still be familiar with this, two hours of recreational screen time a day. You can, I think that's too much for very young children, but at least for very young children, you can actually monitor it because you're turning it on, turning it off. You can't do that for children once they have a phone, they're able to get on their screen all the time. And if they have a computer in their bedroom, you can't distinguish between what's recreational and what's not, particularly for children who multitask. So what I recommend is at least three, at least, and I wanna emphasize at least three hours of screen free time because you do know when your child is not on the screen. And that should be uh, an hour before bed, during all meals, and then, in some after school activity, whether that's a sport or a club, make sure they're unplugged during that time. Number four, digital holidays. Uh, make a point as a family, uh, whether it's for an afternoon, a weekend, a week, that you're all offline uh, together uh, and hopefully spending time together without electronic devices. Number three, cultivate mindfulness. So, you know, I, um, I showed you that picture from, New, from the Newcastle Airport. You know, back in those days, mindfulness came about quite naturally because you were alone with your thoughts, so to speak, quite a bit. 
we're never alone with our thoughts or we never have to be alone with our thoughts these days. And so it, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, you need to actually teach your children um, how to be uh, okay, quote unquote, doing nothing, how to think about, um, to be mindful of, of, of how they're going through the world and not to succumb, it, uh, to be able to tolerate boredom, if you will, and fill it with, with their own thoughts, not with an app. Number two, set and enforce limits. Whatever rules you come up with, um, make them uh, fair, clear, transparent, and, and then enforce them. Whatever your contract says, uh, do what it says. And number one, the most important thing when it comes to media and frankly, everything else is um, to be a good role model. Uh, you are children's first and most important teachers. Everything they see you do, they will um, imitate. Even if they tell you quite blatantly as a sassy teenager, they will never be like you. They'll never do what you did to them. I assure you, uh, they are very likely to do so. So that's it. I'm happy to take questions. I'll want to acknowledge my collaborators, my supporters, my two children, uh, Alexi and AC, and my funders. And then finally, I want to um, suggest that instead of FOMO, we should um, cultivate JOMO, which is the joy of missing out um, and feeling content uh, with oneself and with self-care. I'm going to stop sharing, and um, I think we have some time for some questions. I know I'm not going to get to all of them in 10 minutes, but um, I, as I mentioned, there are other resources. So, okay. Dr. Christakis, first of all, thank you so much. And before we move to the Q&A, we're going to put up a quick survey so that we have a little bit of an idea of where people are coming from. And while they're answering uh, where they signed in through, I want to just challenge one thing that you said. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think we jump to the assumption that kids should have whatever, a smartphone or, you know, some kind of device so that their parents can reach them. And I know this is very different. My daughter's now 20, but I did not, she did not have a phone until the end of eighth grade. It's not yep. that long ago. And my message to her was, I drop you off. I pick you up, go to the front office. Yep. If you know, like why does a kid need a phone in school? They don't. Oh, I, I, they absolutely do not. It, I was, and in fact, it's funny, there are some schools that have now instituted no cell phone policies. I'm fully supportive of that. Um, you can reach, you can reach them through calling the front office. They can reach you. No, I, I, I'm fully supportive of that. Now we did a survey of that. Most schools have cell phone policies. Very, very few schools have no cell phones in schools. And in fact, it's impossible to enforce those cell phone policies. And what ends up happening, by the way, even in schools that don't allow cell phones in the classroom, is the moment kids get out of the classroom, they get on their device. So at recess or lunch, they're all plugged in. So please don't take what I said as suggesting that you need it. You do not. I'm totally, but kids often go from school to right. another activity. Um, they take public transportation home, et cetera. So, you know, in an ideal world, uh, there would be no, the children would, if they had phones, they would be locked up at the school and they could have them when they left. But yes, I agree. They do not need them in schools. So there's, there's a question that I don't fully understand, but I think you will. So it's a question about neurodiverse kids yeah. and their dopamine pathways yeah. and, um, you know, how to deal with kids that have ADHD yeah. within the framework of, of screen time. Yeah. It's an excellent question. So we know that both children with ADHD and children who are on the um, autism spectrum uh, use more screen time and in some cases find it an activity that's soothing for them. Um, for kids with, particularly for kids on the spectrum, it can be one of the few things that we know of that can be calming for them. So, you know, I think um, I am loathe as a, as a physician and frankly, as a parent, to tell parents to, do, to take away something until I have something to offer them that would replace it or work. So, you know, every child is unique. I think it's an important conversation to have with your child's care provider. I will point out though, that children with ADHD in particular who find screens very engaging and fulfilling, it doesn't do them any good to be on it. It's just that it's an activity that they can tolerate because it doesn't command a lot of executive function the way 
um, focusing on schoolwork does. You know, the important thing to think about, and this is not a talk about executive function, that's another talk, but the, the, the challenge for kids with ADHD is not focusing on things that they find interesting. It's focusing on things that they don't find interesting. And the truth is much of school for most students, however hard teachers try, can be not that interesting or it can be challenging and make you not want to do it. So that's the biggest that's the biggest hurdle that all children face with respect to attention. And the fact that kids with ADHD will play games for hours but won't study math for hours is because they find the gaming fun and easy and they're good at it. And the math is challenging and, um, and not fun in most cases. Um, so it's a much longer conversation. We are doing studies around children with ADHD and ASD and their use of screens. And, you know, as I said, it, there's some data that it might actually exacerbate it. It's clear that for some children, particularly with ASD, it can be soothing. I, so I, I can't give clinical advice over this. I don't know the particulars of this child, but I'm, um, I would suggest they talk with their, with their child's doctor. So the, I think this next question is terrific because it really goes wider than screen issues, but, but very uh, poignant. Do you have any advice on how to manage these issues when your spouse is not on the same page and <laughs> right, likely yeah. addicted to his phone, iPad. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, so, I mean, God, I, I you know, I, this is, I, I, it's no different than any other situation when you and your spouse aren't on the same page. Um, you know, you, you, you need to try to, um, uh, you need to try to align when it comes to your children. So I think it's worth um, becoming educated. So hopefully you've watched this webinar. You can find other webinars to watch. You can see my TED talk that looks at that talks about um, digital addiction and young children, um, and 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 try. Uh, you can consult with experts if you want with your child's pediatrician or, or doctor, um, and and try to you know um, do what's best for your child. I think the the, the honestly, I, I'm, I'm not sure I heard the entire question, but it sounds like it may be that there's this one of the parents themselves likes doing these things and doesn't want to acknowledge. Well, there are a lot of things that you do that you don't want your child to do, and I, and whether you do them in excess or not, and I, I think it's worth being honest with yourself, um, and 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 taking a child-centric view of what the best way of doing it is. Yeah, and I mean, as we know, no matter what it is, getting parents on the same page in front of their kids is key. So Essential. figuring that out is 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 tough. I'm going to combine these a, a couple of questions that ask about the balance of educational activities on a, on a device. Cause I mean, you can be doing good things on the screen. And then also um, how do you feel about reading eBooks compared, you know, relative to just good old paper books? And yeah. really good, it's a really good question. So, so I'll, I'll do the eBook one first. So when, when one of my objections with the use of screen time and I, I talked about this earlier in the talk is that puts everything in the same bucket, right? Like reading an ebook might be the same as playing Grand Theft Auto. They're both screens. Um, you know, that's absurd. Um, and I would never equate reading on a Kindle with playing Grand Theft Auto. Um, and in fact, initially I was very outspoken that ebooks should be completely excluded. And they should. If your child is reading on a book or reading on a screen, they want to read the New York Times on their laptop, that's not screen time as far as I'm concerned at, at all. The challenge is, and new research is suggesting that with young children, because the screen has become so equated to them with a play toy, actually when you read an ebook to a toddler, you don't get the same benefits as you do when you read a traditional book because the, the, because the toddler is hitting the iPad trying to make something happen. It's which they do not do to a regular book because nothing does happen on a regular book. So it can be a distraction. So it's again, it's a little bit complicated, but if in fact you're witnessing your child is essentially using this as nothing else than a book, not only should you now count it as screen time, you should do everything you can to encourage it. And that's frankly the nice thing about Kindles versus iPads for reading because Kindles have some games on them, but they're lame. You know, they're not going to be something your kid wants to play. The iPad, 
you know, sky's the limit in terms of what distraction it can provide. The other part of that question was, uh educational oh time. yeah it's you know so first of all let me point out that we we children and screens did just recently an educational summit on the issue of ed tech the value of technology and education in this country is vastly overrated we really don't know um and i say this not as someone says take it out but there are plenty of studies that show no benefit some that show harm a few that show some benefit the truth is, if you look at, from night in, in the mid 1970s, there were about 35 children per computer in US schools. Today, there are three kids per computer in US schools. What has our education, where is our educational standing gone in the last 20, 30 years? Down. If just getting computers into classrooms was the solution everybody thought it would be, we would have expected to see improvements. It's, it's uh, ed tech for me is it's a whole topic onto itself. I think we've bought into the idea that technology is a panacea. It's a great way of learning. It's not clear at all. I mean, it's a tool that can be used well, but I think it's often just used as a crutch and doesn't enhance learning at all. So um, I'm not particularly bullish on technology in classrooms not because I don't think there's value, but because I think that value is exaggerated and in many cases unproven. That I think is a kind of audacious and fascinating note to end on. I love the idea of doing a separate talk just on ed tech, um, thinking about teachers and who's attracted to education given the challenges. So um, I think we'll just say it's eight o'clock. Thank you so very much. And thank you to everyone who showed up and attended. And we had just such active participation with questions. We'll have to do it again. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. And play with your children. All play right. outside. Play outside. Bye. Thank you.